This is probably the hardest message of uh, the series. Um, that's why they gave it to me to do. <laughs> oh, no, they, they would do it well, Cass and Nathan and Sam and the team. But um, it's the topic of when God says no. And I shared a little bit about this a couple of weeks ago. And uh, um, it's come up in, in my talks uh, in the 40 days. But unless we handle this one, I think it's one of the major reasons why people's confidence and faith in Jesus uh, can get knocked around and uh, where people find it difficult to walk with him, attending church, and perhaps just gets disillusioned and discouraged. Um, and it's usually because they have a faulty view of who God is. And so their faith is not according to sound knowledge, according to a sound understanding of what the scriptures teach. Their paradigm uh, is a little bit faulty. At times, no fault of their own. And so that's why we have to teach and preach when we talk about prayer and the power of prayer. Like last Sunday was a fantastic time. We just, we had the Holy Spirit urge to pray with everyone, every service. So we prayed for hundreds of people from Friday morning, 8.30, here, 5.30. And, and if, if there are answers that, that have occurred, instantaneous answers or responses, uh, let us know. Some, some answers take a long time. Some answers don't come the way that we think that our initial prayer focus is. But let us know so that next Sunday, which is Palm Sunday, and uh, we want to have as many testimonies as, as possible of the good news thing, good news stories that are taking place. Um, look, there's a wonderful scripture that Jeremiah says, call to me and I will answer you. Notice, when we put it up, Come on, guys, I'm way ahead of you. <laughs> Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call to me and I will answer you. It doesn't say I might answer you, okay? Or if you're good enough, then I may consider answering your prayer. God promises to answer all of our prayers. Hear me on this, to answer all all of your prayers, but it may not be the answer that you're anticipating because of a whole pile of factors that only is known to God. And the Bible has many examples. You can't read Old and New Testament uh, without seeing that God at times says no. At times God says, whoa, wait boy, wait, wait, wait girl. Or you know what? You've got to do a fair bit of growing up. <laughs> this is not going to be good for you. I want you to grow up. I'm more interested in your character development and your understanding of me than you just receiving from me. And so whether it's Abraham, Moses, David, Elijah, Daniel, Job, Peter, Paul in the New Testament, at times God said no. Hey, poor Abraham. I mean, he gets this promise. The land is yours, the promised land. And so he leaves Ur of the Chaldees. And it says he doesn't know where he's going. He just obeyed God. He trusted God. And he starts walking. And you know, he never stopped walking for the next how many years? He lived in a tent for the rest of his life. And yet the promise was given to him, but it wasn't realized in his lifetime. And so in Hebrews 11, when, when it talks about the heroes of faith, the Old Testament heroes of faith, it honoured those who did not receive in this life what they were believing for, what they were praying for. And God says, I'm, I'm, I honour them. They're men and women of faith. They've done amazing things. Even though they didn't see in their lifetime, he goes, now that they're in heaven, now they can really see. They can see my purpose. They can understand my ways. Even Jesus... The Son of God received a no from his heavenly Father at a time of his greatest vulnerability, at a time of his greatest pain, at the time of his worst period of suffering. In fact, he didn't even hear the no. There was no answer. There was no answer when he cried out, My God, my God, why 
have you forsaken me? The heavens were silent. There was nothing. <coughs> this subject can be really confusing. It can be upsetting and incredibly frustrating. I mean, I, I could tell you story after story. Just one, of, one young guy that, that came to Christ and he gets married and has a baby and, and uh, no, doesn't have the baby, has a miscarriage. And it wrecked his faith. I'm not walking with Jesus anymore. I'm thinking, wow, I think I met almost every family I know. Every woman that I know. In, in the process of, in this sin-cursed world that we live in with, with difficulties and frailties and, you know, that usually something goes wrong. I, I, some don't, but, but it's like this is part of life. But for him, it was inconceivable that a good God would allow that to take place. So it shipwrecked his faith, but it wasn't. It was because of his conception and understanding that, uh, you know, uh, bad things should never happen to good people. Hey? Therefore, good things should not happen to bad people. <laughs> so when it rains, those terrible farmers that are really sinful and doing bad things, God stop the rain on their farm, but only send the rain on the farm of the good guys. No. So sometimes limited understanding that people have, it, 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 it shows the shallowness of their understanding of who God is. And that's why we've got to address this pain, suffering and evil, as awful as, as it is. It can be un confusing, upsetting and, and so frustrating. Because if God is all loving and if God is all powerful and if God is all knowing, why are sincere requests denied or delayed? Some people receive miracles, others don't. Some sick people we pray for get well, some instantly, others don't. Some get relief from pain, others don't. You ask me, do I understand it? I'd say, no. I can't really understand it. There's some reasons that we can come up with, and I'm going to try and give you some here of, uh, to understand why God says no or not yet. Um, sometimes people pray for the exact opposite result. You have sometimes two or three people, <laughs> we have groups of people praying and it's like they're counteracting each other <laughs> in their prayers. Um, how many times? I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit silly, but it's, it's a realism there where people sincerely pray that it doesn't rain so that the footy match or the cricket match is not wrecked. And I mean, they're really like, oh God, you know, I've spent all this money and, I, and you know, thousands of people, oh, they, and yet a hundred kilometers away in the rain shadow area, area over the, the Mount Lofty Ranges, the poor farmers, they're desperate for water. They say, oh God, good God, could you please send the rain? Whose prayer is God going to answer? I suspect the farmer more so than the, if he does that. You know, like uh, I've stopped praying for my sporting heroes. I just get too wound up. I mean, I, I, I get wound up, and if I'm watching sport, I'm, I'm into sports. I, I, I rain down curses on the enemy, the opposite side. Not very Christian. I pray the blessing of God upon those people. And you know what? The Lord never answers my prayers. And usually the team that I'm barracking for loses, so I've stopped praying that prayer, as if the good God of heaven, he just chuckles at my silliness, but he doesn't answer those kinds of prayers. Hey, more seriously, World War I, World War II. Germany. Strong Christian nation. Incredibly strong Christian nation. The, the revolution of the Protestant Reformation, the Evangelical Lutheran Church. And uh, in Germany, I mean, they, they're very strong. But in World War I, pastors in Germany, same as in World War II, in Australia... The leading troops, the leading services, God help us, God help us, God help us. And I think in the First World War, not so much in the Second World War, because a lot of the German pastors were going, we hate this Hitler. In fact, there were, there were, there were pastors and uh, generals who wanted, they, about 20 attempts on his life. And, uh, um, you know, kind of, he lived through them. Amazing. 
such a demonic man. And so a lot of the churches were actually against their own, their own government in, in, uh, uh, in Nazi Germany. But the First World War, they were sincerely praying. Whose prayer did God answer? Ours or theirs? Who won? We won. Like, you think, how do you work that one out? Well, I think the best theologian in this matter that's come up with probably the best statement would be Abraham Lincoln, one of my heroes. And he wasn't even a theologian, he wasn't even a pastor. He didn't actually get saved till 1862. So a lot of mythology about Lincoln, he's a hero. If you read my book, The Leader I Can Be, you see I've mentioned Lincoln a lot because I love him dearly. And uh, I think he's the most amazing man and most influential leader, I would argue, over the past 200 years. His influence is still being felt today. And uh, we just think of this. If the United States dissolved in that civil war and it became a whole pile of nations, what would the 20th century and 21st century look like? Would all be speaking Japanese or German or Italian? So it's been the USA that basically kept the world free from the tyrants, the demonically inspired governments that tried to subjugate the world. And even the war on terrorism. So you just think, what would the world be like if there wasn't? Well, it's because one man recreated the United States in his own image through the Civil War. Want to see a good film? See Lincoln by Steven Spielberg. I'm getting cuts. I'm getting uh, profits out of this by advertising it. But, um, but seriously, uh, Lincoln uh, gets saved in 1862, and he's, he's through the death of his son. Two little boys died on him. One before uh, he became president and one when he was president. And uh, he loved those kids. And um, interesting man, he never disciplined them, never told them off. And they'd run into the cabinet room and wreck things and, and the cabinet ministers would be going, these kids are just... And he just, his philosophy was, I used to get beaten into a pulp by my dad because I think kids should be free to do what they want and just to, for us to love them, but rightly or wrongly. So he was actually indulgent on his kids. He just, just loved them. So when um, Willie died in 1862, it just broke him. It, 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 um, um, he couldn't get over it. So he'd go to the tomb every day, every day, and lift the sarcophagus lid and just look at his boy for a couple of hours. So people thought he was having a breakdown. And um, so it was a, an African-American lady um, named uh, Mrs. Keckley, who was the dressmaker of the president's wife. And, and she actually uh, spoke to him about faith and introduced him to the Presbyterian minister who came to visit him and told him the story of King David and, and how David grieved and the little boy and, and, uh, and then David came to the conclusion that the boy can't come to me, my baby, but I, could, I will go to him. And uh, so Lincoln got saved and um, in the midst of a terrible war, the American Civil War in four years saw 750,000 soldiers killed. That's not civilians. Unbelievable suffering. Uh, terrible bloodshed. Uh, you go to the Gettysburg sites where the memorials are, and I've been there, and uh, it was uh, 50,000 men died over a period in three battles in Gettysburg. Just this, this area, it's just terrible. Uh, two armies, 200,000, 250,000 men fighting and uh, killing each other, brother again. It was a terrible, terrible thing. When you study it, you realize how civil wars are shocking. So he's trying to come up with an answer. How come? He's watching the pastors, the leaders, praying down south to protect the institution of slavery. He's watching the pastors praying for their, their soldiers. He's watching the, the pastors and leaders in the north. And, you know, in his second inaugural address, amazing, 1865, just before he was murdered, he gets elected the second time, and the second inaugural address is the only time where a president has actually given a, a, a theological statement. He preaches about the sovereignty of God. He preaches about this issue of prayer. And so the whole message is actually one of the finest statements to try and understand how a good God, a sovereign God, could allow all this bloodshed that even he himself couldn't understand. This is what he said. He says, both read the same Bible. Have I got it up there? I don't think I have, do I? Or do I? Guys, is it up there or not? No, it's not up there. Okay. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, north and south. 
In each ev- evokes, invokes his aid against the other. In other words, God, get them and let us go. <laughs> you know, like. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purpose. And he basically came back to saying, you know what? God loves us. Some of those prayers were answered. He goes, but none of them have been fully answered. And he he actually didn't say, God's on our side as the North. He actually said, God has his own own purposes. And I think that's that's a a really good, good, uh, good answer. So people often pray for the exact opposite result. And that causes a lot of grief in people's minds and hearts um, on that. But secondly, people have free will and God will not take this away. Um, He made us as free agents, moral people. We have the power of choice. We can choose between two, a good direction, an indifferent direction, a bad direction. He hasn't made us robots. Uh, We have the capacity to choose to follow him. We have the capacity to choose to do what's right to our fellow neighbour. And the sad history of humanity from the Garden of Eden is, is that people have ignored God and have chosen to do the wrong thing to their neighbour. And that's where we have all the troubles in, in our world. Um, you know, um, I've had people say to me, sincere people, you know, hey, God's revealed to me that this particular girl is going to be my, my wife or this particular man's going to be my husband. And, uh, and I'm thinking, I don't think so. My, I don't think so. Do they know anything about it? No, but God's told me. Well, all right. He's told you. So I'm trying to say, well, if it's God, it's going to have to be the other party's going to have to make some choices. Don't you? Like, you try and make it happen. And it's like, or, or God... The people sincerely praying, and this is a heartbreaking one where marriage is falling apart. Make my husband love me. Make my wife love me. Please, Lord. So they won't leave, and they leave. And the prayer is not answered. And if only they could see, the father weeps with them. He's like, this is terrible, this is awful. Jesus sees every sin, every evil, act of evil, and he weeps. And, and yet he has created us with the freedom to make choices. And that's, that's a reality in our world. Um, I had a, a woman once come to me, and, and she was part of our, our church family in the early years. And, and she was convinced that God told her that she should divorce her husband. I said, he has? Tell me more. How would you come to that conclusion? She goes, well... The Bible says we should not be unequally yoked. Light and darkness. You get all these scriptures out of context. And the man wasn't a believer. I said, but what's he done so bad? Well, you know, like, I don't know what he did. I said, does, does he, has he committed adultery? I thought, I'll start with that one, the big A. You know, like, has, he, has he been a, a serial adulterer? I mean, even adultery can be forgiven. I've, I've dealt with people that have sinned and been restored again. He goes, no, no, he's very good in that area. Okay, fine. You know, I went a bit for, has he raped you or anything like that? Oh, no, no. He's, he's very clean and all that. Oh, fine, good. Has he ever beaten you? No. Does he drink too much? Oh, he has a few drinks down the pub with the boys. You know, good Aussie healthy sin, you know, like just, 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 just nothing bad, just with the boys, you know, just having a few drinks, maybe a few too many. Does he work hard? Yeah, he works hard. Does he supply? Has he been a good dad? Yep. How do you get to the point that you say God has told you to divorce him. And she's using scriptures out of context and, and misapplying what God's heart is. Anyway, I, I said, look, I love you heaps. I said, but I think you're misguided. So I tried to give her a Bible study. She didn't want a Bible study from me. She wanted my endorsement. I said, loving pastor. <laughs> so I'm thinking, I can't. Anyway, so she sort of <laughs> took off, left the church. Ironically, her husband got saved and became a fantastic, committed Christian in the church. I don't get that. Like, so she left. She's a believer. He comes in and he, become, he, get, he gets saved through the whole thing. So, um, but she was thinking that somehow God was directing her and not saying it, you know, she was really camouflaging the fact 
and deceiving herself. It was her will, it was her choice that she chose to do that. And um, so people have free will and God's not going to take this away. Um, when it comes to healing, you think about healing the sick. And I believe in praying for the sick and we'll pray for you today. And uh, there are people that are getting healed. There are people being blessed and encouraged. But, but if, if it's just your prayer and your level of faith that were the only factors for you to be healed, then you'd never die. Okay? If, if it was based on your prayer and your level of faith and they were the only factors in, in you being healed and you had prayed the right way, you had the right level of faith, you'd never die. But that's ridiculous. Uh, Hebrews 9.27 says, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face the judgment. We're all going to die. Hey, we're all terminal. While here on this earth, every one of us. But we can live forever, not just here in this, on this earth, but all in heaven. So therefore, it's illogical, isn't it, when you think about it, to say, well, if I had perfect prayer, you know, if I prayed the right way and I had perfect faith, then I'd never get sick. Well, that's ridiculous. Or I'd, or I'd never die. No, that's, that's not right. There's, there's the overriding principle that, uh, that all human beings are going to leave this planet. It's just where we go afterwards is the key. Are we going to heaven or are we going to hell? Only faith in Jesus will destine us to heaven. Um, so people have free will and, and God's not going to take that away. The, I remember when um, a terrible day of my life when my mother at 60, younger than me, in her early 60s, had this killer stroke. Just out of the blue. Dad finds her collapsed in the, in the kitchen and they rush her to the hospital. So, you know, I get the call, my sisters, and we all race to the doctors come out going, man, this is really bad. They've checked it out. They're saying she's not going to pull through. This has destroyed so much of her brain. We could see, you know, like they did a whole pile of tests and, um, and my sisters have just... Dad was numb, <laughs> you know, like she's well, she's talking. And then, bang, this. And then uh, my sisters are getting you know, pretty hysterical, upset. And I, and I just found myself, like, the memory, what came out of my heart was, I just said, no, God. I said, no, God. Because the memory was, I never knew my grandparents. And I'm just a newly married man. I'm 97. I said, I never knew my parents. They lived, my grand, they lived and died in Greece. And, I, and this thought came in, my kids are going to see their grandparents and know them. And I said that to my sisters. I said, no, she's going to live. Let us pray. <laughs> so we kicked the doctors and everyone out and we prayed. And she lived for 14 years. She lived for 14 years. She was paralyzed on one side, and, uh, but her mental faculties were, were fine. And, and uh, I don't know why God didn't heal her completely. I don't know. But he gave us 14 more years so my four children were able to know her and love her and uh, then she went to be with Jesus. And it was actually interesting that it was through that stroke and the suffering that both my mum and dad, I led them to Christ. Amazing. And uh, she was just an amazing woman. So, um, so, it's like, God is good, but I don't fully understand how, how, it, how the answers come or don't come. People will never be able to satisfactorily explain this mystery of prayer denied or delayed. You can't. Uh, sometimes it just doesn't make any sense and, and tragedies are heartbreaking. Um, you read the book of Acts, the first 12 chapters. You think, well, James gets killed. Herod beheads him. He liked it. He goes, oh, I'll kill some more. This is John's brother, James. He says, I'll get Peter. So they get, Peter lived. Stephen gets stoned to death, but Philip escaped and let her revival. Why, why did Philip live and Peter live and James and Stephen die? The Bible gives no explanation. There's no explanation in the book of Acts. Nothing. It's like silent. You know why? Because I don't think Luke had an answer. It's a mystery. We just don't know. But in the providence of God, this is... This is you know, I learned this 
really hard way, very early in my ministry, and before I became pastor of the family centre, I'm um, serving full-time, evangelising the schools, and there was this older lady who was a dear friend. She was old enough to be my, my mum, and, and uh, she got saved in our neighbourhood, and she got saved around the, a bit earlier than me. We became very good friends, and, you know, I'm witnessing to her kids, and, and so she rings me one day, she says, Billy, did you hear about what happened to, to so-and-so? I said, no because there was this couple that we knew that were a bit troubled. She goes, they're children. Because one of the, the little kids took her medication, her antidepressant medication, fed it to the other kid, and the little kid died. And then the child took, took the medication, it's in a coma in the hospital. And she said, you need to go and talk to them. I'm like, man, what am I going to say? Like, go talk to them. So she said, you need to go and talk to them. So I went uh, to the hospital, and, and I was young, and uh, enthusiastic and full of passion and full of belief. And, and I crossed the line when it came to, I gave a guarantee that that little boy would be healed after we pray. Can you believe that? So the parents are there, they're listening to me. And I talk about Jesus and salvation. I shared the gospel with them. One of the boys had died. I'm saying, the other one's going to live because Jesus wants him to live. And we're going to pray prayers of faith. And they're all getting excited. And so I laid hands on them, laid hands on the little little fella and uh, and I went away then the funeral for the the first child was a couple of days later and I and I turn up at the jolly funeral parlor and there's two coffins there the other little boy had died earlier in the morning <gasps> and there's two he died too I'm thinking wow I just wanted to run I didn't want to stay there and I'm thinking man and then it just hit me what was I doing giving a guarantee as if I'm God and, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I'll never do that again. I'll never do that again. What a foolish thing to do. And I'm repenting and praying, and I just want to run. I don't want to stay there. The, 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 the person who did the funeral was the worst funeral service I've ever been in. I wanted to hit him. He just basically said, because they were not baptized or sprinkled, you know, we don't know where they are, you know, and, and it's like, no hope, no nothing. To the poor parents, I feel like screaming and saying, they're in heaven with Jesus. They're innocent. Give them some hope. Give them, show them some love. Just callous. It was just a terrible, terrible time. So the funeral ended. I, I took off. Now, I'm getting out of here because if he sees me, and he was a bit of a wild boy, you know, and tats and, you know, sort of alcohol, drugs, and I thought his love would have whacked me or something. So I took off, and then somebody comes running after me. I'm in the car, I turn the window down a little bit, and they says, I won't mention their names, says, they want to see you. I said, when? Now. <laughs> Come to the house, to the wake. I'm like, oh, man. I'm there, all right, all right. So I, I turn up late, of course, you know, praying, oh, Lord, help me. So I go into the house, and, and everyone's, the wake's, and, and I'm aware there's a couple. They're in the bedroom. And they said, are you Bill Vassal? I said, yep. They want to see you straight away. I'm like, oh man, what's going to happen in the bedroom? <laughs> so I go in there and, and, and they both just said to me, could you help us to get to heaven because we want to see our two boys again? How do we get to heaven? Like I'm thinking... And I, of course, then realized, well, okay, now into the action mode, you know, like, so <laughs> I shared the gospel and they just said, Billy, we want to go to heaven too. We want to know. They just said, we, we want to, to have the, basically the assurance that they will see their two boys again. So I led them to Christ and started nurturing them in the faith. But I never forgot the lesson. Don't cross the line because God was merciful to me and to them. You, you can't you can't speak for God in those areas where God himself doesn't say we have authority. And man, we have to be so careful on this one. I think of Job as, as an example. If you haven't read the book of Job, it's a great book. But it's unexplained suffering comes upon this guy and it makes no sense. It makes no sense. The devil's involved, God's family. It's just... And then he has three friends. He loses everything. He loses everyone except his wife. I make no comment about her because I'll get shot down. But she wasn't a very nice person in times of suffering. Now, she'd also lost her children and lost all their wealth. But 
what comes out of her is not very pretty towards, um, towards Job. And uh, anyway, so, but let's, 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 let's be kind to her because she suffered a lot too. His three friends come, his three buddies come along. And they did the right thing to start with. You know, seven days they sat with him and didn't say anything. Kept their mouths shut. Wise move. Wise move. Don't pontificate. Just show up. Be there. Be a presence. Just love, support, make dinner, make coffee, make tea. Just, just be there. Sometimes you just don't know what to say. And how many times I've said to people, I don't know what to say. When you go and visit when a little baby's just died of cot death back then when it was a terrible thing. And, and uh, you know, I go and I see this little baby, beautiful couple in the church, and this baby's like this, blue. His hands are fixed, and I'm thinking, ah, oh, it nearly killed me having babies myself. You know, like just, wow, I, I did not know what to say, what to do. And uh, the most you can do is be a presence and be, be there to support, pray. Um, So these guys did the right thing. They showed up and they were good. Then they opened their mouth and trouble started. Oh, man. They thought they were resident theologians. And, you know, God in heaven's going, you said what? The second guy starts, oh, what? That's not what I'm like. The third guy starts. And Job's giving answers. I mean, they're, they're giving all their reasons why this stuff has happened, you know, like trying to pontificate. And God in heaven's going, what? You're misrepresenting me. I'm not like that. <laughs> so anyway, God couldn't contain himself. And in chapter 42, he tells them off. And he says, I'm angry at you three boys. I'm angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. And even in all the suffering that Job went through, boy, did he have a clear and beautiful picture of what God was like. He didn't understand it all, but he understood that God is perfectly loving, perfectly just, all-powerful, and that some things are a mystery. We're on thin ice when we try to explain what God himself doesn't explain. There are some things that he doesn't explain. Look at Solomon, said it in Ecclesiastes 11.5. As you do not know the path of the wind, none of us do. Wind just goes, just appears. Or how the body is formed in a mother's womb. Yeah, you really understand that? Two little cells, one from a male, one from a female, two eggs, become a zygote. They can check the thing and it divides by a process called meiosis and mitosis. So the nucleus divides, they check it out, and it's exactly the same. The cell's exactly the same. Whew. Does it again? They're exactly the same. And then a mysterious process starts called cell differentiation. No one knows what triggers it. And all of a sudden, they, can't even, they don't know what's going on. This amazing human being starts to form. Mysterious. You think you know how babies are made? No. It's a mystery. It's amazing. It's miraculous. And a woman's body becomes a chemical laboratory. Amazing. Amazing. I used to teach all this stuff at human biology. How the bones become soft and supple for the baby to ultimately be able to come out. And, and I have every respect for women. Men just have one chemical and that's enough. Women have got about 3,000. And when they make babies, it's like all this stuff that's just going on. You're like, it's amazing. As you do know the path, as you do not know the path of the wind, nor how the body is formed in the mother's womb. So you cannot understand the work of God. You think you know everything about God? You don't. Don't be like the three who pontificated to Job. And all what they said was nonsense. And misrepresented God. Moses said at the end of, of, of the great Moses, who w- walked and talked with God so closely, he says this in Deuteronomy 29 The secret things belong to the Lord, our God. But notice this but the things revealed belong to us. What God reveals belong to us and our kids that we may follow the words of his law, but they're not, we don't know everything. And look at Paul, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So what can we expect from God 
in times of confusion or suffering. I wanted to share just, just Paul and Jesus, then we're going to take communion together. So what can you expect from God in times of confusion or suffering? Well, one of the best examples is Paul's thorn in the flesh. And he introduces the subject very personally, and we still don't know what the heck it was. No one has satisfactorily come up with an answer. What is his thorn in the flesh? Was it an eye problem? where he had to have others write his letters, he had to dictate them and others sign them because he couldn't see, maybe he was going blind, that's what they suspect. There's a couple of scriptures that hint at some significant medical problems. Other scriptures talk about the unusual amount, number of times he was beaten and assaulted. We know at least three times assault and battery to the point where uh, um, today people will be jailed for 10, 15 years. Uh, and other, other times where they tried to actually murder him. And uh, um, so we know about two or three times. It was, just, it was just everywhere he went, blessing followed him. But there was also this cursed influence. And he kind of said, I think it's a demon. I think it's some devil that's, that's, that's dogging me that's causing all this trouble. May, they may, that may have been his thorn in the flesh. We don't know. That's more than likely. But this is what he prayed. This is what he said to us. He goes, three times I pleaded with Jesus to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Then he goes, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties... For when I am weak, then I am strong. Folks, we all have thorns in our flesh. You know, the, the, the biggest learnings in my life, and I guarantee it's the same with you, the, the biggest learnings and growth occurs not in your pleasurable times, but during your painful times. So in your, ple- your pleasurable times, you don't think of God and character and you, and, but in your painful times, it's when you're saying, God... I need you, help me to see, help me to understand. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you. That's his power, that's his life, it's, we need him. So the more we acknowledge our weaknesses, and some of you have got thorns in the flesh that have not dissipated, they're there, and you're struggling with it. And he's saying to you, hey, my grace is sufficient for you. Some of you have got, got your marriages are just not good. There's nowhere it says that you're guaranteed to have a happy marriage. It doesn't say that. Some people are fantastic husbands and wives, but the marriages are really unhappy for varying reasons. And they're tough, difficult. Talk about Abraham Lincoln. You read about his relationship with Mary Todd. She assaulted him out in the street in Springfield bashed him over the head in one of her manic moments. Everyone said, divorce her, divorce her. She went insane after the president was killed, after he was killed. Then her third child died after the president was killed. The third boy died when he was 18. And and, And the oldest son put her in an asylum. She got a court order to get out of the thing. And she locked herself in her house for 10 years and no one saw her terrible but their marriage was so difficult extremely difficult and probably there was some kind of mental health issue with with mary and probably some kind of mental health depressive issue with the president as well because he would he would he used to suffer deeply so um but you can succeed in life and not everything go well in other departments of your life that may be your thorn in the flesh it may be some member in your family It could be some weakness in your flesh that keeps, ah, you've gained victory and then it kind of pops up again and in a different circumstance. You think, I thought I was on top of that. It just arises again and it's there. But I'll tell you what, it gets you on your knees. It gets you on your face to say, God, I need you. I need your grace. I need your power. 
He knows how we're made. He knows how we're formed. He knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. It's a wise woman, a wise man who knows their own weaknesses and vulnerabilities and, and, and covers, makes sure they get God's grace and power to cover them in, the, in times of, of difficulty. You know, so what can you expect from God in times of confusion or suffering? Grace, 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 grace. Power, power. So admitting your weaknesses, you know, the, the beginning of healing is really the acknowledgement of, of weakness. I think so. I think you, you can't really get healing on the inside unless you acknowledge weakness. You know, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When you admit to your poverty spots, and blessed are those who mourn, who, who, are so, who just, God, I'm just, this is my poverty spot, this is my weakness, for they will be comforted. The second Beatitude. And the comforter is the Holy Spirit. He comforts us. He helps us. So the prideful can't receive grace and power. But the humble can. As we humble ourselves, and we shared a bit about this last week. Um, and then Jesus modelled how to respond to pain, suffering and evil. What shall we do when we are in the dark valley? What the heck do you do? You're in the middle of a dark valley. <coughs> and I've been through several of them. And I tell you, it's dark. It's not nice. And, um, you know, and this is Jesus. Mark says this in Mark 14. He went on a little further, farther, and fell to the ground. And he prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour waiting him might pass him by. This is in Gethsemane. And he cries out, Abba, Father. In other words, God, intimately, you're my dad. You're not just God in heaven, transcendent, separate. You're my, you're, my, you're my dad. I know you. I love you. I know you're loving and kind. Only somebody who understands God to be loving and kind and good will cry out, Daddy, dear Daddy, I need dad's help he cries out and he says this everything is possible for you so he affirms God's unfailing love and kindness and God's limitless power and and this is what we are to do we're to follow Jesus in this to model ourselves how do we respond to pain suffering and evil and then secondly ask God for help with honesty and passion and this is where the Lord didn't answer his prayer Please take this cup of suffering away from me. I think God the Father must have been so pained. I can't. I won't. You know, we, we, we decided this together, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that you were to go. You chose to go, to die, to become Jesus of Nazareth. You would never be a spirit being again like, like me. You, you will always be, look like a 33-year-old Palestinian Jew. And, and, and so, but he actually prayed, says, God, I can't do this anymore. I can't continue. Take this away from me. There's nothing wrong with praying prayers like that. But if you think God's going to answer your prayers the way that your own confused thinking or d distemper or frustration, you've got to share those. It's healthy to share those with God. King David did that in the Psalms. And so Jesus asked God for help, but he was honest and, and full of passion. But then, have a look at this, he accepted God's plan, and he submitted to, to God's will. He said, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. But everything, all his emotions, all his feelings, all his circumstances were telling him, run, 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 cut and run, don't do it. Too much pain, too much suffering. His circumstances, his situation, his feelings, his thinking, his emotions, he's sweating great drops of blood, but he doesn't act on those things. He says, you know what? I accept that God is good. I accept that God is kind. I accept that God is loving. I accept that he is the boss and I'm going to submit to him even if it half kills me. And that's what Job says. Even though he slay me, yet I will have put my confidence in him. It's a weird statement, but as if God's going to kill him. At that level of confidence and that's why people who have this kind of deepest level of faith will last the long haul you won't fail you won't fall over no matter what pain suffering and evil comes your way you understand who he is 
Can we pray together? And then we're going to take communion to seal this time. Father in heaven, we thank you for, Lord, your word and these amazing scriptures and this final one of Jesus and the previous one of Paul. We're blown away by those statements, Lord. And yet we, we see how, what we can expect from you in times of terrible confusion and suffering. And, and people here today, Lord, are, are in, in areas are facing confusion and, and going through terrible suffering. The thorn in their flesh has risen again and they don't know what to do. And I pray, oh Lord, that they would find grace even today. They would find the power, the strength, the resource in Christ to endure even if this thing never goes away, but they will endure, that they will persevere, that they will go forward in you because you love them. You've called them according to your purpose. So Lord, have your way and help us not to deny our weaknesses, but to see that as we acknowledge our weaknesses, this is the first step to the journey of of true healing, lasting healing. That's, That's based on dependence on you, you who now live within us. And Lord, for for Jesus as we, we see how he actually responded to this terrible time of suffering, this awful, awful, awful levels of pain that he experienced and, and the evil that was going to be done to him that he knew was going to be done. And Lord, we, we see what he, what he said and Lord, help us as we take communion together to affirm that you're a God of unfailing love that you're a God of of kindness, that you're totally good and you have limitless power. And Lord, even as we maybe don't know exactly what to pray, but we agonize and as Jesus prayed that this cup of suffering be taken away, Lord, at times as we've prayed, the thing has not occurred because you see things that we cannot see. But you love to see honesty and passion and authenticity in our relationship with you. So help us, Lord, to be honest and transparent with you. Even if the answer is no, even if the answer is not yet, even if the answer is, son, I want you to grow more. Even if there's silence from heaven, as Jesus didn't hear anything back when he cried out, Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Help us, Lord, to model ourselves from Jesus and to accept your plan and to submit to your will in our lives. Touch people now, Lord, as we seal this 40 days of prayer with communion. Help us, Lord, to be really strong in faith and and an understanding of what it means to have faith in a biblical way as we've seen here. We ask it in Jesus' name.